Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. My name is John Cameron. I'll be your host for the evening. Uh, Libertarian Counterpoint can be seen in the greater Sacramento area on uh, Channel 17, uh, 8 o'clock on Thursday, as well as noon on Friday, if you manage to get Friday off, or if you're at the office and are bored. And my favorite time, 4 a.m. on Saturday. Can be seen on other channels. What's that? Prime time. Prime, prime, prime time can be seen on other channels in the uh, Sacramento area. I think in Davis it might be Channel 18, part of the Comcast world here. Um, and uh, well, my favorite way to, to watch Libertarian Counterpoint is on YouTube, uh, because that way you can pause it and make rude comments, have drinking games every time one of the people goes, uh, 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 shot of tequila. No, I don't do that. Uh, sounds like fun, though. We might have to, we might have to start doing that. So. Um, my name is again John Cameron. I'll be your host this evening. Uh, Lee Welter is one of my guests, Jack Hartpence. And what we're going to do, starting with Jack, put Jack on the spot, start the show, is talk about, for about a minute, minute and a half, what brought us to the liberty movement? Why are we here? Why are we libertarians or close to it or, or anarchical capitalists or objectivists or whatever we label, label ourselves? Jack, you want to go ahead and lead off with that? Sure. Uh, I came to the liberty movement uh, when I was a, a young guy, I was living in New York still during, during 9-11, still a young guy, yeah. um, but really had a moment where I found out what it meant to be an American and how important uh, our liberty is. Mm -hmm. um, so from a young age, I was very interested and in always following, uh, you know, government and over big government bureaucracy. So over time, I've just really gotten entrenched in the movement, and it's something that I became very passionate about. Mm -hmm. Now, has that led you to what you do for a living now? That is, yes. Mm -hmm. I work at uh, the Pacific Legal Foundation. Um, love it there. Mm -hmm. Recently joined. Recently joined. Um, but I have been in the movement for several years. Yeah, and you worked for Goldwater before that. And in yep. both cases, you're, you're, I, I do kind of the same job Jack does. Um, and and uh, that's raise money so that the uh, pit bull, uh, funny, brilliant pit bull lawyers that we have who are passionate about the cause can... Uh, free of charge to our clients, fight for their constitutional rights in the highest courts of the land and win. A little pitch for Pacific Legal Foundation. And then Lee, you want to talk about how you came to the liberty movement, about when and how? In retrospect, I had liberty or libertarian instincts from an early age, but I didn't recognize them formally for what they were. It was only the past two, two and a half decades that mm -hmm. I, as a lifelong learner, I spent more time learning about uh, uh, the history of liberty, uh, reading Thomas Sowell's works, mm -hmm. excellent economist, and um, some basic books like uh, Bastiat's The Law, mm -hmm. Translate, excellent translation from the French. It's well worth reading. You can go online and uh, go to the, I think it's the Mises uh, Institute, M-I-S-E-S dot -E org, and download a PF. Uh, PDF uh, format and, and enjoy That's, that. It's in the public domain now. It is. No, it is okay. indeed, and it's uh, it's a, it's a good read. And uh, oh, there's so many things. In fact, one of the things that sparked me was hearing uh, former President uh, William Jefferson Clinton mm -hmm. in a recorded phone conversation with his uh, mistress. Mm -hmm. uh, he said. He started by saying, I'll deny ever saying this. As soon as I heard that, I knew what kind of person he was. Mm. I've, I've heard that before, and those are people who cannot be trusted. Mm. And he sort of proved it, didn't he? Yes. Oh, he may have been real clever, but he wasn't very honest and certainly not of good character. Mm. And uh, I learned more about him, and, uh, and then I read about Lyndon Baines Johnson very unscrupulous guy, very ambitious, but uh, very self-serving. Mm -hmm. And uh, likewise, another very clever p politician. He knew to kiss up to the people that had the influence and mm -hmm. not think very highly of anybody else. Mm -hmm. And even our ostensible hero, Franklin D. Roosevelt, mm -hmm. the Roosevelt myth mm -hmm. uh, by John Flynn, who was very influential or and very knowledgeable and involved with politics at the time, and he revealed what a scoundrel Roosevelt was and 
how we prolonged the depression, how we sort of dared the Japanese to get involved <laughs> in the Second World War, and, and oh, too much, no. too so much we could, You know, the problem about this is we could go on with talking about what got us in the liberty movement now, forever. Concerning the scoundrels of history, let's, let's go to the, after the scoundrels of the current uh, You're events. You're talking about me, I have to do my introduction, a scoundrel of right now. So I, uh, I've, I've always been a patriot. I, uh, I volunteered for the military um, right after the Vietnam War. Well, actually, toward the end of it, I jumped out of airplanes and carried a machine gun for a living, and I took an oath that said, I swear to uh, defend and protect the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And domestic, those are foreign the most serious threat these days. Yeah, and when I, I got out of the military, I went to school, and I'd always been kind of a, an objectivist and you know libertarian leanings. I went into business, was uh, worked in publishing, and then started my own business as a consultant and trainer. And constantly, as I was training people and engaging with them in their businesses, the, the things that they would come in that looked beat down, and I would ask them a question. So is competition rough out there? And they said, no, I can deal with the competition. I can deal with the long hours. I can deal with the vagaries of the economy. The thing that crushes me, that crushes me, is this government. It's this beast that's got its boot on my neck, and I can't do anything about it. And, you know, that's why I do what I do for a living, raise money for Pacific Legal Foundation so we can help pull that, that boot uh, of the beast off of the neck of the common citizen. And so we've all come to this in different ways with the same kind of, of underpinning, I think. And so now we're going to talk about what you really want to hear about, way too much of us. Let's talk about uh, some of these things that, that uh, if, if, if you went to, to somebody and, and said, this would make a great plot for a book, they'd say, it's unbelievable, nobody believed that. Let's talk uh, open. Um, with Jack and, and uh, kind of a lead-in. Brooking Institution poll. Nearly one in five college students favor violence against speakers who say offensive and hurtful things. More than half favor shouting down such speakers. Have they never heard of the First Amendment? What is your reaction to this, Jack? What do you think? Well, you look at uh, what's going on at the University of California, Berkeley today. Ben Shapiro recently uh, spoke there and they had to spend $600,000 on protection uh, for Ben uh, because of the Antifa and what have you. And, Is and, it Antifa or Antifa? Or? Uh, I don't know, yeah. uh, to be honest with you, but it just blows Domestic me. terrorists by whatever name. Hey, well, yeah. well it, it blows my mind um, that that can happen, especially at UC Berkeley, the place, the, the birthplace of the free speech movement in the Birth 60s. Place, oh. um, but, you know, violence has never accomplished anything in terms of... Uh, a revolution. Only peaceful revolutions have, you know, actually held their ground. If you look at how Martin Luther King mm. led or Gandhi in India, those were both very peaceful revolutions that led to actual change. Um, and frankly, I mean, the Antifa, uh, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, their end goal of what they're trying to accomplish. What do you think they're, what do you think they're trying to accomplish? What, what, let, let's let that Jack finish. What do you, that's uh, what, what I see uh, well, the I suppression of a viewpoint, I would well, say. Well, suppression of a viewpoint, but suppression of one viewpoint, but their own viewpoint. If, if uh, a uh, communist, many of the instructors at, at uh, UC Berkeley are avowed communists, if a communist speaker came on and talked about um, the um, uh, nationalizing the wealth of rich people and redistributing it. They'd love uh, it. And, and even if it required uh, showing up at their place of business with a gun in hand to do this, they would be welcome. But somebody who has an opposing viewpoint, one that perhaps maybe uh, more, more clearly follows the Constitution of the United States, they're shouted down. So it's, uh, you know, free speech as long as you're... On their side. On their side. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, Lee, you wanted to say something? You jumped well, in for a minute there. Many thoughts. One is that divisiveness has been a very mm. successful political propaganda mm. tactic. Mm -hmm. Put groups, don't worry, you're being abused, but mm. we'll take good care of you, and protect you from these, this other evil group here. Yeah. And don't worry, you're being abused and threatened by these people over here, but we'll take good care of you. You just give me your vote and, and everything vote, will be fine. Give me your rights, give me your money, we'll protect you. 
and you can sleep soundly in bed at night. That's the promise, but the promise uh, is broken by the, the, uh, the thud of the jackboot with the brown shirt at your door. That's the real problem, Absolutely. folks. And I think the real problem also is uh, college campuses today and yeah. the denial of free speech on campuses yeah. and yeah. how, uh, you know, I'm a recent college grad. People are molded uh, by professors into one doctrine. All they hear is one doctrine. They're not hearing a wide array of mm. thoughts. And thoughts even can be suppressed. Uh, and on top of that, universities that are receiving public funding, mm. uh, state money, um, ought to allow freedom of speech. It is in the Constitution. Mm. Um, so it makes no sense to me that you can have universities like a UC Berkeley that are denying certain viewpoints from entering their campus. Mm. Uh, and that's you know stemming down from the higher ups of the higher ed system. Mm. I, I have noticed something about the so-called anti-fa movement. Well, first I noticed that uh, it's typically young white men and I noticed that they are uh, typically hiding their faces and they're hiding behind masks. And normally when you see them, when you see the aftermath of these riots, there'll be, uh, there'll be a march or a protest or a speech. And typically you'll see five or six of these young men uh, kicking some middle-aged person who's already down on the ground. But if it were, for example, the Hells Angels mark for march for uh, freedom of expression through tattoos, I doubt very seriously if these young lads would be uh, quite so eager to try to suppress them. What's your thought on that? Well, I, think, I think some of these thugs are mercenaries. In fact, uh, several years back, there had been some kind of a uh, international conference in Seattle where the... Uh, uh, was that the Monetary Fund? Wasn't something that? like that, yeah. yeah the rioters did tremendous amounts of damage. There was a similar kind of uh, agriculture-related conference in Sacramento where, with advanced warning, city council enacted what was then called the parade ordinance, mm. which prevented people from bringing weapons along or having signs with metal poles that could mm. be used for a evil, baseball evil stuff. bat and gloves and slingshots and, and the like and uh, yeah. uh, so the damage there was still some damage there was still a little bit of violence but it was very minimal at a city council meeting not long after that event the FBI reported that there I think they said there were about 13 people who were at this event this event showed up at this event Clearly, they, that was their... So they were professional they thugs. They were professional thugs, exactly. So who's, who's paying for these thugs? We want to That's talk a good question. theory here. George Soros' name, we could throw that. Now, so I don't people, know if Well, they always pick not. on him. I, I don't, don't really wanna, know. I don't want to libel the man. I don't know, have any proof. So I'm, that was said facetiously. In a, but another in a, point, there were nine, ter uh, nine uh, perpetrators arrested in this uh, recent uh, uh, Berkeley event. And if you take that $6,000 or $600,000 cost, mm -hmm. you divide it by nine, it's more than 66000 a person. Mm -hmm. Now, they probably don't have that kind of uh, resource, but it would be very justified to say, mm -hmm. pay your share of the bill, folks. Oh, yeah. I like that idea. I like that idea. Make people bear the cost of it. And, and yeah, so we could we could you know beat this wasn't to death for a long time. It is it is troublesome. It is worrisome. And and I seem to remember when I swore that oath, it was defend the Constitution of the United States, not defend it for some people, not defend it for others. Uh, I find you know some public speech abhorrent, but I will protect anyone's right to say pretty much anything they want in a public forum as long as. Uh, somebody else uh, gets a right to, to say something opposing either then or later. But we pretty much all agree on that, that, that that's following the Constitution of the United States. That, um, and I think the Constitution expressly says that, that you're violating someone's First Amendment rights if an ordinary, um, a person of ordinary firmness would be chilled in their activity by the threat. And I think the idea of being beaten senseless or hospitalized or, or hit with a stick that holds a sign would, um, uh, would make some people of ordinary firmness think twice about opening their mouth and speaking. And to me, this is a, 
a very straightforward First Amendment violation that should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Yes or no? Yes? Absolutely. Okay. All right, why don't we move on to the next subject? And that's, uh, I think, you, Lee, you're leading off. What are you leading yeah, off on? The, 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 Russian collusion, and, and this, this brings to mind a, a different metaphor. Uh, you're getting onto the subway, somebody sort of bumps you like this, and you don't feel the uh, other, other hand going into your pocket and taking something out. So in, if nothing else, this is a distraction. Uh, what do the Russians have to do with the election? Well, it's really hard to say. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, but we haven't, there are no facts. We haven't seen any facts. Who needs facts? Well, we just had allegations. The investigations well, that, that's, underway. that's why um, Jack and I spoke briefly before the show. Um, and and he had, his thought was this thing has been beat to death. But I wanted to make, you know, kind of have us make this point before we move on. And that is, there's no there there so far. There's no proof of anything. Yet the press in its uh, completely even-handed treatment of both political parties has pretty, when did much, this happen? pretty much uh, convicted, tried and convicted the current administration of somehow colluding with Russians uh, to affect the outcome of the election so that uh, President Trump would win and Hillary Clinton would lose. Now, nowhere lately has been mentioned the fact that Hillary Clinton colluded with the people in the Democratic Party to uh, suppress a candidate. That was mentioned briefly, but not a whole lot. So I guess the point is whether there's any there, there or not, uh, the press doesn't appear to need a there um, to try and convict the, the politician who's in their crosshairs of bad behavior. And that's really all I kind of wanted to say on the subject. Anybody got anything to add? Well, let the facts come in and then we can talk about it. Yeah, and, and best on, uh, based on uh, not great depth of knowledge. It, it seems to me that the people who are chosen, the so-called investigators, James Comey, and what's his name, Mueller. Mueller. I, Mueller. Those are, Mueller. Those are the, yeah. the the foxes guarding the hand house, aren't they? Well, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and and one account says that uh, James Comey started writing his uh, exoneration of Hillary Clinton before the investigation was even started, right? Did, well, did, did that? True, or is that just a I, I do not know. My depth of knowledge in this, I, I'm not saying I lack interest. I, I have an enormous interest in the political spin, but I, I'm uh, facts, as Jack said repeatedly, are either hard to come by or non-existent. And I will be a very, uh, um, our brilliant attorneys say the facts make, make, good facts make for a good case. I will be very surprised if any good facts come out. Uh, and I will, I will, uh, um, be skeptical about any finding of the United States government, uh, a uh, grand jury or, or uh, uh, investigator at this point. But uh, it, it would be great to see uh, this disappear from the news so that we can uh, focus on some things that are important, like reducing this huge regulatory crushing burden we have um, that costs uh, about a trillion dollars a year in this country. Just cut that in half. You know, just half a trillion in savings, that money pumped usefully into the economy. Maybe we get out of this uh, recession we've been in for, I don't know, 20 years that they say is over, but nobody realizes it's over. You were, we were all coming. Well, I have, some, I have on, some another optimistic yeah, thought here, that uh, if the current administration managed to get the dregs out of what recently was the Department of Injustice yeah. and uh, starts prosecuting some of these people for... Um, uh, accessing what should have been classified information and broadcasting it mm -hmm. uh, and the like. Uh, there, there's so many. Uh, you think mm -hmm. if somebody has uh, vital information to an investigation on their computer and they smash their computer with a hammer, is that obstruction of justice or is that just somebody having a, 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 fit? a bad mood swing? Um, I would say obstruction of justice. But, you know, again, we could, be, we could talk about this particular subject and, and Jack get is anywhere. bored with it, so we're going to move on. Let the facts come uh, in. Let the facts oh, come in and right we'll talk say, about it. Let's move on. What's our, next, uh, what's our next and who's taking it? Uh, somebody's going to talk about gullible warming. Gullible warming. I th may I? Talk well, a little bit please, about that, Lee, or did then you I'll, talk I'll, about Why don't you kick it off, and then I'll j okay. jump and then in Jack, when the you've time got, is right. You probably want to weigh in, since you're, uh, you live uh, in Jasper? 
Yeah, I live up in uh, the high Rockies. Yeah, all right. And you had uh, already some pretty low temperatures and some snowfall there. We have. Yeah, a little early or about right or? Uh, about right, a little yeah. early, a little yeah. early this year, actually. A little early. So Record let's... snowfall uh, last year, though. Right, and we all had the Rockies record snowfall here in the Sierras. Record coming snowfall off of in the Sierras. Four hurricanes. Yeah, yeah. As so, well. Yeah. So, um, and the nice thing about the climate change folks is that they can blame anything on climate change. The climate and always changes. Climate always changes. Yes, it does. But this, this, the point when when I bring this up, and I probably bring it up every show I can, and this is what I want people in the audience to think about, and I want to ask you some questions about. Can you think of any of the predictions? the dire predictions that have been made by the global, either the people 40 years ago, 35 years ago, who said that we were entering another ice age and we had to prepare for it, uh, or the people who've talked about um, untenable, drastic rise in earth temperatures and sea level rising and drowning New York, polar ice caps disappearing, uh, species being wiped out, um, uh, uh, folks starving to death or being mass migrations uh, uh, from these areas affected by global warming to to uh, other parts of the world. So let let's let me just throw the question out. First, I'll ask Lee. Um, what do you think the accuracy of the predictions of that crowd has been so far? I have a great comeback on that. It'd be just a little tangential, but uh, there's a fine book titled The Deniers. Mm -hmm that looks at scientists who don't have government grants to, mm -hmm. to bias their view one way or the other. One of the experts was a truly highly regarded statistician. He looked at Michael Mann's hockey, hockey stick, stick equation. Well, we call it hockey puck, but go ahead. Yeah. Exactly. And he, as an experiment, he put totally random data into it. Every time, it gave that same hockey stick curve. Mm. What does that tell you about connection to reality? Uh, not, not, not very meaningful. So I just, let, let me, again, back to my, my question. I'm not trying to pin you down and put no, you on no, the spot. No. But um, can you think of any one of the dire predictions by either the folks who predicted um, the uh, coming ice age back in the 70s or this tremendous rise in global warming that's come to fruition? Any? Have they been grants? Well, they keep getting grants. Can I Have challenge they? you for a second? Yes. Oh, that's sure, because uh, I'm on a, kind of a different viewpoint slightly. Yeah. Uh, how long have those predictions been around? Well, the, how long the, have people been predicting that you know the polar ice caps were going to melt? Twenty years. Twenty years. Thirty years. 20, yeah. Well, in the history of the Earth, what is twenty years? Nothing. It's a smidge. Yeah. So uh, you know, the carbon footprint, I believe, is real, and mm -hmm. while climate change i don't know if the earth is warming it could be cooling mm -hmm. i don't know but the there is no way that carbon emissions are healthy for our planet i don't think i disagree mm -hmm. we can we can disagree you're being well, yeah, and I'll, and I'll, I'll tell, yeah. can i tell you why yeah um the current uh carbon dioxide level in the atmospheric uh, the atmosphere is somewhere in the range of 370 maybe 380 parts per million, per million. if it goes to zero all the green plants die. If all the green plants die, all the animals die. That includes us. That's mm -hmm. one perspective. Another is to look at what I would call settled science. Uh, the, um, the archaeologists and uh, scientists have looked at distant history, the Carboniferous period, mm -hmm. millions of years ago, uh, had an atmospheric CO2 of 2,500 parts per million. They had the most lush vegetation and uh, animal life of any period in the in the Earth's history. Mm. How did that did that 2,500 parts per million? Did that destroy the Earth? Mm. By no means. It was it did the opposite. In fact, people growing in a greenhouse will elevate the CO2 levels artificially to 1,500 parts per million. Mm. Nearly. Or have times some politicians. Have now, we're all I'm not for uh, overspending of government or mm. the. Uh, economic burden uh, that some of these programs would create. Mm -hmm. I do think uh, in a certain degree, it could be a situation where it's better to act proactively than retroactively. Mm -hmm. And if we can clean up some of our uh, you know, plants and start uh, making it so the earth is uh, you know, more inducive to our long-standing life, we really have nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I even, we, we even, a few years back, we had a panelist who had a real 
depth of knowledge on uh, a project that in, on paper anyway has been a high priority for the U.S. government since 1972. Hydrogen fusion electrical power generation. Uh, uh, hmm? Well, I think, yeah, I, um, if I'm, I'm in disagreement with, with uh, a lot of things Jack said, and that's okay. The thing about libertarians is you don't want two of them to ever speak to an audience because they're going to disagree. Uh, there, there are an awful lot of folks who, who think it's all a bunch of who either or other people that see it as a problem. But, um, you know, what I'd love to see is that, that uh, anybody who's uh, doing any of these things follows the Constitution of the United States and doesn't use the threat of global warming or global cooling to, uh, you know, extinguish property rights and extract taxes out of people in favor of one uh, type of industry over another. You know, let rational people make rational decisions based upon the knowledge and not based upon some kind of model. And I don't know if we got we got time for one more. Is there another hot button issue we can spend about a minute on? Uh, who wants to tell me, Jack? You want to tell me about how wonderful Jedediah uh, Bila is? Uh, and you got one minute to do it. And, and what's wrong with her leaving the View? Brains can and you do beauty that in, in one package. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, recently it has been a storm on the news. She uh, was quite critical of uh, Hillary Clinton on the View, <gasps> and uh, about a week later announced her resignation, which uh, they say is not correlated. However, she was. Uh, uh, a very up-and-coming uh, panelist on The View until that incident. So I think it goes without saying that there must have been some correlation yeah. uh, between the two win, events. It's wasn't sad. she nominated for an Emmy uh, for her role on The View? She and was. Wasn't, uh, wasn't the, one of the shows that she was an inherent part of or an integ integral part of also nominated? Yeah. And then, then she spoke against Hillary. Well, I thought she just asked a question that... Uh, for which Hillary had not prepared the appropriate lies. Ah, you know, catch her, ah, catch her with the question that you yeah, can't she lie needs her questions ahead of time. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, we had our questions ahead of time and still disagreed. So that's the way people need to act, um, should act. Um, in Disagreement this is healthy. Country. Disagreement Definitely is that. healthy. Different viewpoints are healthy. When you suppress one, you suppress them all. And uh, that's why we're here on the Libertarian Counterpoint. So you at least hear uh, a slightly... Uh, different viewpoint than you uh, normally would. And I'm going to do a time check, uh, and it looks like we're, we're heading down the path to closing out. So I'm going to say once again, you can watch Libertarian Counterpoint um, on Channel 17, 8 o'clock on Thursday. Or online. My favorite, or online on accesssacramento.org. Or on YouTube, I want to thank my guest, Lee Welter. Thank you, Jack. Uh, the, the brilliant knowledgeable thank you, Jack. man. And Jack Hartpence, my new... Uh, my new uh, co-worker, colleague at, uh, at Pacific Legal Foundation. Great show, fellas. Thank you so much. And have a wonderful time. Appreciate and thank it. Thank you to our wonderful crew who does this uh, every week. Good job, guys and gals.